Welcome, Linda. Also, lovely to meet you. So, Linda Rocco, you are independent curator, and, and we're really, really lucky to to have you here to chat to us and tell us a bit more about your your work. So, can you tell us a bit more about your background and how you got into curation? Sure. So, I was born in Italy as a dancer. I danced my whole life since the age of nineteen, where I got sick. And at the time I was living in London and working in a company um, and I basically stopped walking uh, from a day to another. So I ended up hospitalized for six months more or less. And then I came back to Italy and I started a BA in history of art. Um, and then I sort of uh, went back to London for an MA in curation in 2015. And then I've started to curate things basically since then. Wow, what an amazing background. You must be able to bring in so many different influences um, from your previous career. That's amazing. I guess. Yeah, I feel like I have sort of double perspective, you know, being yeah. on the stage, but then also knowing what, what's happened behind us, sort of. Yeah, yeah, it must give you a really great sort of insight and different hats to wear and different things to draw on. That's amazing. I guess, um, what was your educational experience growing up? I guess you mentioned that you, you trained as a dancer. What about your educational experience sort of outside dance as you were growing up? So I come from a working class background. So I was the first one actually in my whole family to have a BA degree. Oh. Um, and I wasn't thinking about uni while I was dancing because I was obviously very focused on training, mm -hmm. you know, having started at the age of three, uh, you constantly t train. Uh, but then when everything happened, I realized I couldn't really rely anymore on my body. Mm. And so I decided to undertake an MA and it kind of and that really uh, managed to open up all my aspiration and I really realized the breadth of the things mm. I could still do mm. uh, and so then that's how I moved to London and I was fascinated by the amazing curating and and I also recently started a founded PhD um, so yeah that's kind of my move to education Amazing. And so you mentioned your, your PhD. I know you're at the RCA, Royal College of Art, at the moment. Uh, what, are your, what are the main themes that your PhD research is, is looking at? So I'm, I'm interested in the values that we as art practitioners bring into the larger world mm -hmm. and how to best recognize and promote those values uh, to be implemented, particularly in sort of real life scenarios mm -hmm. to ultimately affect societal change. Um, I'm looking at the reasons why artists are excluded in debates concerning the future of our society and civilization mm -hmm. and how to best advocate for the importance of what we do and how we approach processes mm -hmm. uh, going a bit away from the notion of the artist as genius. Mm -hmm. I'm also very interested in transdisciplinary collaboration long term particularly with STEM subjects okay. and how to best apply the curatorial um, in terms of uh, networks and value creation. And so I look at sort of uh, avant-garde movements of the 60s and 70s, particularly Fluxus, mm -hmm. but also um, experimental art technology and APG, uh, mm -hmm. but it's practice-based. So that's sort of the literature that I, I refer to, but then it's very much based on practice. Fascinating. So bringing the artists to the table and drawing on, drawing on artist insights. So I guess you guys must see more than any of us in a lot of ways because you're, you're trained to observe, aren't you? Whereas a lot of us aren't really. So you must see more than, more than anyone. Definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I have an overload of artists that I both work with from around the world because I have a very collaborative practice. So I never do things by myself. Um, and always very kind of really collaborative ethos. So I try to involve as many artists as possible almost. I mean, mm. very much that kind of approach to do things and, and include. Mm. So I work, I work with loads of artists, but then obviously the knowledge as well that comes from doing consultancies, but also from going to shows and really uh, experience the London scenes and, and mm. beyond. Mm. Oh, brilliant. So, such, so exciting, such a really interesting uh, set of topics to be looking at. I can't wait to hear more about that when when you get to the end of your your PhD project. Yeah. I, thinking that back to your curation, how would you say that you bring in those themes you're looking at um, in your PhD into your curation work? Do they do they link? Do they have an input? 
Well, as I said, my PhD research is practice based. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, to me, there is not really a distinction between uh, my work as a researcher and my work as a practicing curator. Okay. Yeah. Also, I'm, I'm interested not much more in objects, but I'm really most interested in processes and the processes mm -hmm. by which ideas are mediated, circulated and transformed. Mm. Um, when I'm commissioned, obviously, the research process is, is kind of influenced by the constraints of the situation, so mm -hmm. fundings, but also aim and scope of the commission. Mm. Uh, but equally, also my PhD research is funded mm -hmm. and that has an impact as well. So it would be quite naive, you know, to say that I have no constraints in, in, mm. in my research at all. Mm. Um, really, my interests are entangled in all those discourses that refers to participation and processes, access to both to opportunities in terms of education and technology, mm -hmm. uh, to human centric innovation, mm -hmm. and kind of thinking around democratic and transparent forms of coming together and governance as well. Mm, really interesting. Gosh, I guess given the world we're in, um, in the pandemic crisis and all of that, how have you found that that has affected your work and your research in the last year or so? So I must say that I started my PhD during the pandemic in October. Ah. So just the beginning and it really felt like a blessing to be stuck at home and, and be supported to undertake such a huge research. Like mm -hmm. I really feel like I'm in a very privileged position and I've just started. So I'm very busy, you know, and being obviously shielding, it's, it's, goes well with having lots to do basically yeah. <laughs> um, um, work wise i was definitely affected especially march april 2020 i had two or three projects that were supposed to take place and then got kind of postponed or moved to digital realm but that actually was extremely um positive to me because i started to think around curating by proxy Mm -hmm. and how to best engage as well audiences through digital tools and all the problematics in terms of access especially and participation and come with it mm -hmm. so two projects that were supposed to happen that moved digital mm -hmm. uh, one is called where i'm coming from and it was a month-long program commissioned by the inclusion Nibari foundation that we moved digitally mm -hmm. so each week was tackling a specific language spoken by migrant community uh, very much in England, but not uh, a bit in kind of, um, how can I say, invisible, mm. uh, in sort of especially art and culture dynamics. So mm. each, week, each week was dedicated to showcasing specific artists from that country. So it was um, Berber languages, Filipino, Taiwanese, and Yoruba, mm. Nigerian artists, etc. And we were working on showcasing works online and using different medias, really trying through different platforms, uh, how to convey um, mm -hmm. and best present the works. And then another project that was supposed to happen in Lincoln um, called Celsius, it was a partnership with the Antarctic Heritage Trust. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the fact that the, the kind of the program moved digitally allowed me to kind of expand the discussion around Antarctic as well, yeah. and then bringing again more experts but also amateurs in the sense you know lots of mm. people that were interested in the topic mm. uh, that wouldn't necessarily have been able to come to Lincoln yeah so as well it was interesting to explore how to work within constraints I think that if there's something that disabled people really know well is kind of resilience and how to work with what we've got yeah uh, so that was definitely you know afterwards I could tell that there was a definitely kind of a good process and learning experience to me mm. so I guess there is a, a silver lining uh, um, in in like you say in the disruption that it's caused and that you've widened the table essentially of if we're going back to that table analogy um, and <laughs> bringing more people to the table which is which is great yeah. brilliant definitely. so I've got a few more questions which are sort of slightly different um, different track um, how do you think education plays a strong context in your work and research so looking at education more broadly 
so as I briefly mentioned, I'm really interested in applying the curatorial to knowledge production yeah. rather than yeah. uh, kind of thinking around objects or collection care mm -hmm. or display. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really more interested in processes. Okay. So education to me is pivotal to everything I do. I'm a really strong advocate uh, for a flexible and long term approach to learning. Mm. I'm quite critical of the recent kind of government push towards a STEM agenda. I think there's a bit of an obsession mm. uh, regarding the skills that we need, especially if considering that we are facing an automated future. Mm. Um, and in terms of my research, I'm using the RCA's field of action to kind of tackle certain issues, such mm. as the siloization of higher education institutions and how everything is really kind of siloized. Mm. And, um, and I really decided to work with and around the infrastructure of the RCA, uh, which is the educational context where I kind of practice now, mm -hmm. uh, rather than kind of against it. So in this sense, my very, pra my very own practice is, is as well uh, context specific. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, obviously being in the RCA really allows mm -hmm. for that to flourish. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I guess we've linked to that. Um, I guess the RCA is, in some ways a public institution i know technically it's not but it sort of feels like it is um <laughs> when your work with with public institutions um can you explain a bit more about your work with them on sort of accessible and socially engaged arts yes so i'm uh, just to tell you a little bit about my work currently mm. um yeah. i'm creative consultant for the greater london authority which is basically the mayor's office yeah. I was working with them last year on uh, Lindiga uh, Deaf and Disabled Festival mm. um, in, uh, in, in partnership with the Board of Culture, which was Brent. Obviously, right. nothing happened due to COVID. The festival was almost yeah. ready and I was very excited, but then <laughs> nothing happened. Mm. Uh, so this year now, I'm working with them towards the assembly of an advisory group, the Liberty Advisory Group, oh. um, which will advise uh, for the next four years. Wow. Uh, the kind of vision and then the engagement of Liberty. And I'm also leading on some R&D commission that we're going to launch next week. Oh. Uh, there's a kind of a good pot of money uh, for works only by deaf, disabled and neurodivergent artists for public commission in Lewisham. Oh, so that, that's the side. Um, and, and then I'm also, um, I, I run a festival in Cambridge, a disability arts festival um, that started in 2019 and now is, is a consultancy and program of workshops. And instead for more kind of for another level of socially engaged, I also have run a non-for-profit organization with a Filipino friend of mine that we mm -hmm. met during our kind of previous study and yeah. with, uh, we work with rural communities particularly in Southeast Asia wow. and so we work on connecting and bridging the UK with, um, with rural communities there so oh. that's sort of, of um, some example of socially engaged work and mm. and I would say that in terms of uh, experience um, working in such institution and a diversity as well of, of the dynamics I must say that um, I had a very positive experience aside for few kind of past uh, experiences where I really had to learn how to move mm. and, and convey my position and 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 really kind of negotiate. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm now working with teams that are very kind of open-minded and flexible mm -hmm. and really value uh, mm -hmm. my lived experience, mm. uh, which is great. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. That's great to hear. You've got so many plates spinning. I don't know how you're keeping them all up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't really see a, a, a blurred between, you know, I don't really see any boundary between work and life. I'm one of those, you know, when they ask me what's my hobby it's my work like i don't really see much difference so i really live and work in a sort of a symbiosis kind sure, of you're in a very connected <laughs> way yeah oh, and it's good on mental health as well to me at least you know keep me busy yeah. really gives me the strength and the stamina you know to, yeah. To keep yeah especially at the moment yeah definitely yeah, exactly yeah just the last couple of questions. So um, why do you think inclusivity in the arts is so necessary right now? I guess it links with, with the previous discussion, but, but please, please share your thoughts. So I think the arts is, has been and still is in a quite of a peculiar position in the sense that 
the arts are perceived as such an elitist field mm. uh, and very much an elitist one. You know, mm. if you think about art education, it's still perceived as an ads on, like mm. something that certainly, you know, kids uh, won't really be pushed into study because it's not mm. something that necessarily give you a job. Mm. So there's really kind of a narrowing uh, of, of, I think, um, our cap capabilities in relation to wider discourses. Mm. Um, and at the same time as well, the arts itself, and if, if we look at the market particularly, it's kind mm. of medieval, you know? Mm -hmm. If you look at the art market and consider that still uh, the majority of, of artists selling works are male, mm. uh, you know, there's just a very little percentage of female, um, and, and there's well the price comparison, is it's, it's not even, uh, mm. you know, comparable actually, because mm -hmm. the most valued work by a male artist is, triple the value of female artists yeah. um, and again and also the typology of works that function in the market is still very much paintings you know so very traditional <laughs> ideas of making art so i think there's this kind of a disruption among amongst the market the, as this sort of like almost this opaque system uh, mm -hmm. made of lots of people that are there not necessarily because they you know they studied or they are even interested in them, but maybe because they happen to be there due to uh, kind of an elitist position. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so being inclusive is as important as, you know, as ever in the sense that we really, uh, in times as well of such social political turmoil, I think this it's really a chance for us to advocate for less rigid and stagnant infrastructures, mm. more progressive forms of inclusion to offer that really much needed diversity in the offer. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we really end up to um, into this very vicious circle of, mm -hmm. of niche contemporary art, which I think mm -hmm. is not very efficient and it's also quite boring yeah. you know if you're being inclusive in the art and really opening it up and welcoming peop different people different types of of um human beings really will ultim ultimately beneficial to uh, the field as well and mm -hmm. understanding as well how to make space for others mm. um, yeah definitely yeah, i guess for me anyway i guess art is a way of understanding other people and other people's views and trying to learn more about your, them and yourself in the process right so if you're only learning about one particular type of person because that's the type of artist that is around then it's not very representative is it but it's sort of a no. sort of a stagnant um pool of ideas i guess exactly and yeah. then the whole well the whole industry around the arts is it's highly inaccessible for a whole series of reasons you know mm -hmm. I, I I don't believe in full access you know I, I very much um, I'm quite uh, how can I say uh, I'm quite doubtful when I hear you know people aspiring to full access because mm -hmm. the reality is that in our in our diversity you know certain access provision and needs might differ accordingly to each one's own disability and it's really hard to to you know look for a a, a total kind of um actual solution easy access for everybody you know i don't believe in one size fits all at all mm -hmm. but equally uh we're so so uh rigid you know mm -hmm. and then in terms of getting fundings getting commission uh, uh getting into a gallery i, I also actually work in a gallery not now uh, but I assist the, the co-director of a gallery in central london three days a week and it's 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 the same the, the, the practices are really kind of old and unflexible mm -hmm. so i think a whole is well redesign of how to make the sector more inclusive from mm -hmm. really from even from education from upskilling mm -hmm. from learning really uh, all the way to uh, having a successful career and as mm -hmm. well I think realizing as well that what what really is a successful career you know I, I feel like lots of artists often have the myth of you know mm. oh yeah we'll have a gallery representation and, and I will succeed you know mm. whereas uh, there should be a bit more of um, thinking around as well the sustainability of an artist's practice and where artists could be placed mm. to really contribute meaningfully to, mm. to society or mm. other this is beyond the gallery the museum and the institution yeah and i guess that brings us almost full circle back to the beginning where we were talking about bringing artists into sectors that they may not sort of traditionally be be in but actually would be really beneficial to to be in so that's a, a lovely sort of 
dovetailing of our of our chat we just have one one final question and you meant to, mentioned earlier that you're a little bit skeptical of the uh, the pushing of stem subjects i mean what do you think um why do you think it's important to highlight such important contexts like well like stem i know you don't agree with that but maybe other um other subjects what do you think are the important subjects to to highlight well, I'm a total advocate and my whole PhD is about it as well, about transdisciplinary collaboration. So mm -hmm. really the what happens when the arts mingle with other um, fields mm -hmm. and I'm researching particularly into social sciences and STEM. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but if, and, and the thing that we as our practitioner really bring important questions to those fields, mm -hmm. you know, questions related to the engineering of public spaces and mm -hmm. of Publics, the diversity of publics, we really raise question on the urgency of certain scientific advancement and discoveries mm. on the ethics and the use of tech in terms of access and distribution. Mm. I really think that STEM needs the art, but not only as an add-on, as mm. it often is depicted, you know, to further help promoting the sciences mm. in a way that looks nice, you know. Mm. Uh, so, for instance, often to push a STEAM agenda instead of STEM, all they do is maybe packaging a nice, you know, STEAM bus that goes around the towns to show nice, uh, in a nice aesthetic, how to, to kind of push for STEM. And that's, a, and that's perceived as a way to integrate the art. Whereas I think that we can bring much more beyond the kind mm -hmm. of aesthetic and decorative way. Mm -hmm. We really bring question to the table which are often very difficult but question that not many people are willing to ask mm -hmm. and and so really the the kind of um it's really important i think to be able not only to recognize but it's also my aim through the phd to articulate and push and support uh for those values that we bring being able to really identify them mm -hmm. uh, and, and 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 discuss how they are beneficial to other contexts mm -hmm. and i mean of paper, especially during COVID, the WHO released uh, numerous, stat, numerous stats on the impact of, of kind of uh, arts in health, you know. There's, there's plenty of studies uh, in that sense, but also in all other, you know, in terms of urban development, mm -hmm. urban planning, if you think about Chester Gates, so lots of artists that are working in that domain. Mm -hmm. But there's somehow the feeling that we always stay in a suspended um, sorry, speculative domain, mm. and we never managed to really make an impact through those actions. And probably it's because, rightly so, the artist is actually busy doing their own work, you know, mm. so you can expect from the artist to as well, you know, push for their for the great results that they bring. So I think mm. there should be a more kind of an ecology and an ecosystem of support to really being able to implement mm. all the numerous and already existing researches that really prove the benefit of what we do into the wider world. Yeah, so I guess it's bringing home that view of art as a tool, just like any other subject or discipline, it's a tool for action, for real action, and making sure that that's recognised and added to the toolkit that is used for all life's issues i guess is that is that a fair summary yeah <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> brilliant well it's been so lovely to speak to you and, and get to know a bit more about you and about your work and i can't wait to hear more about about your phd findings at the end and look forward to hearing more about your many projects as they start mm -hmm. working digitally or, or um in the meantime or and when they get back to being in person hopefully soon <laughs> when all this is behind <laughs> Lovely. Thanks so much, Linda. Yeah, and speak to Thanks you soon. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. -bye.